Hi, and welcome to the next lecture in fluid mechanics. Last time, we considered all the major non-dimensional numbers we see regularly in fluids analysis. This included the Reynolds number for viscosity, the Euler number for pressure, and the Froude number for gravity. All of these are forces that we compare to the inertial forces when creating non-dimensional numbers. There are many more non-dimensional numbers, and it seems like new ones are showing up all the time as we explore broader, more complex fluids problems. Today, we will introduce the Buckingham Pi theorem, which is a procedural way to solve the non-dimensional numbers in a problem. With that, let's jump in. Say you're new to a fluids problem, or you just have a set of variables, outside of fluids, and you want to analyze for functional relationships between those variables. What if you don't already happen to know the non-dimensional numbers of your problem? Well, there's a procedure for that. Following a set of rules, we can arrive at every possible non-dimensional parameter. And this brings us to the Buckingham Pi theorem. It finds non-dimensional numbers, called pi groups, from a set of variables with dimensions. As you'll see, it combines the strategy of dimensional homogeneity from a few videos ago to find non-dimensional numbers we covered in the last video. First, we will define all the steps of the theorem and then go through with some examples to try it out. Here's the general procedure. Step one, you need to gather all of the meaningful parameters of your problem. This first step can be the most difficult. It's hard to tell what matters and what doesn't. With practice, it gets easier, but it does take a little bit of a background knowledge in the problem you're working with. The number of variables you choose is n. As a tip, you want to avoid variables that are either defined by or are combinations of other variables that you've chosen. For example, if you already have area, a, and velocity, u, then defining the volumetric flow rate is redundant because it is defined by the other two variables you already have, q equals ua. In step two, we can quickly try and guess the non-dimensional numbers that exist in our variables by visual inspection. This can save you some time if there are easy ones to see. For example, if you have a length, a time, and a velocity in your variables, there's inherently a non-dimensional parameter with those three variables. By seeing and creating it up front, we don't need to find that one mathematically later on. For step three, we determine the base dimensions for all of our variables. Remember, base dimensions are mass, length, and time, among others. The number of base dimensions that exist in your problem is m. Almost always in fluids, m equals three because we generally work with only mass, length, and time. However, you could have a different problem, like in electrical engineering. You can deal with things like electrical current as a fourth base dimension. In step four, we can directly calculate how many dimensionless numbers we can expect from this group of parameters. The number of pi terms are n minus m, where n was from step one and m was from step three. For example, let's say we have a problem that gives us the variables p for pressure, u for velocity, rho for density, and the length scale l. This is n equals four variables. If we write out the base dimension set for each parameter, pressure is ml to the minus one, t to the minus two, u is l times t to the minus one, and so on. In this set of parameters, we only see m, l, and t, so our m is equal to three. These are our base dimensions of the problem. That means that since n is four and m is three, we can expect only one dimensionless term from that group. Moving on, in step five, we select m number of variables from our bunch. If m equals three, which it most likely is, then you pick three of your variables. These get called repeating variables because we plan to use them in every dimensionless parameter set. The only rule here is that every base dimension must be represented by this group of repeating variables. 
For example, if you chose L, a length, U, a velocity, and A, an area, it doesn't work. Here, only length and time are presented. There's no mass. However, if you chose length, velocity, and density, you're good to go. There's no set strategy here, as long as you follow the one rule. However, you can make your life a bit easier if you choose repeating variables with few base dimensions, the simplest repeating variables you can choose. Now, in step six, we set up our dimensional analysis problem. From our leftover variables, the non-repeating variables, we use each individually to create an individual pi term. If we were to assign the non-repeating variables as q, so q1, q2, etc., and the repeating variables were m sub 1, m sub 2, m sub 3, then the equations that define the pi terms are pi 1 equals q1 times the three m's, each to an unknown exponent. Pi 2 is q2 times the three m's, each to another set of unknown exponents. Note these are different exponents, despite all being labeled a, b, and c. Take, for example, our variable set of p, u, rho, and l. From these, we know that n equals 4 and m equals 3. This means we have one expected pi term. Let's choose u, rho, and l as our repeating variables because all base dimensions are there. That leaves us with the pressure p as our non-repeating variable. This means our pi term is generally defined as p times u to the a, rho to the b, and L to the C. This is our general problem that we need to solve and leads us right into step seven where we solve for these exponents. Here we use the same strategy as in dimensional homogeneity from two lectures ago. The only difference to dimensional homogeneity is that here our left-hand side of the equation will be all zeros. Take again our running example of parameters P, U, Rho, and L. We left off with pi 1 defined as such. Now, we set up the equation with the base dimensions. On the left-hand side, things are dimensionless, so m, l, and t are all to the zero exponent. On the right-hand side, we gather all of the base dimensions for each parameter, distribute the exponents, and then gather all like base dimensions, just like we did in dimensional homogeneity. Because we have three base dimensions, we can set up a system of three equations for the exponents. Remember, since base dimensions are independent, the exponents on the left have to equal to the exponents on the right for each base dimension independently. Set up and solve the system of equations for exponents. This gets us that pi 1 equals p times u to the minus 2, rho to the minus 1, and the L drops out entirely. Arranged in this way, you might recognize that we found the dimensionless parameter called the Euler number. If you remember from the last video on non-dimensional numbers, the Euler number compares pressure to inertia. And that's it. In seven easy steps, you can find any non-dimensional parameter your variables can provide. Let's do some examples. In the first example, we'll consider hydrodynamics and pipe flow. Here, we have water flow going through a circular pipe with velocity u. The pipe has diameter d. And since we're working with water, we can also consider the density and viscosity, which are fluid properties. Gather our variables, u, d, mu, and rho. This means we have n equals 4. Next, we inspect the base dimensions of each variable. All variables are some combinations of mass, length, and time, so m equals 3. If n equals 4 and m equals 3, there is only one possible non-dimensional number in this group. The leftover variable is the non-repeating variable, d. Set up the general equation for the pi term, equal to d times rho, mu, and u to exponents. Transform this into the equation of base dimensions. On the left-hand side, there are no units, so m, l, and t are to the zeroth exponent. On the right, we have the, each term individually. 
we can distribute the exponents and gather all of the base dimensions. Each base dimension gets its own equation. The set of equations is solvable either by brute force like we do here, or with some computational tool like Wolfram Alpha. Once we have our exponents solved for, we can plug them back into the main equation. With rearrangement, we get that pi 1 is equal to rho u d over mu. This we know as the Reynolds number, which compares inertia and viscous forces. So we see how the Buckingham Pi theorem can pull out common non-dimensional parameters and flow problems. Let's set up another example that will have more than one pi term. Consider the drag on an airfoil. Here, the airfoil is in a flow, and we are concerned with the force of drag the foil feels due to the flow going past. This is a classical aerodynamics problem. The flow has velocity u, and air has properties density and viscosity. We also know the chord of airfoil is c. Collect our variables, f sub d, u, l, rho, and mu. This means n equals 5 and m equals 3, so there are two possible non-dimensional numbers. Let's use u, l, and rho as the repeating variables. This leaves us with the drag force and the viscosity as our non-repeating variables. First, we consider the drag force in the first pi parameter. Set up the general equation for pi. Since at this point you're familiar with the solution process, we'll solve it in double time. Write the equation for the base dimensions and the exponents. Distribute the exponents and gather all the like base dimensions. Solve the system of equations for the exponents. Rearranging, we see that pi 1 is fd divided by rho u squared l squared. In aerodynamics, this is very similar to the drag coefficient, a common dimensionless parameter that defines the foil performance. Let's move on to the second possible non-dimensional number, which considers the viscosity as the non-repeating variable. We're even better at solving this now, so we're going to solve it in double-double time. Here, pi 2 is mu over rho l u, which is the inverse of the Reynolds number. With the Buckingham Pi theorem, we have found the two possible non-dimensional numbers in this set of variables. In practice, Buckingham Pi is a useful tool to use in new problems with sets of parameters. Finding the non-dimensional numbers is critical for fluids analysis, and sometimes the problem you encounter doesn't already have common non-dimensional numbers to refer to. As we'll talk about more in the next video, we want non-dimensional numbers for a number of reasons. First, they minimize the number of needed parameters to measure to find functional relationship between a set of variables in a problem. Also, as we've talked about before, they define flow regimes for various flow problems. For example, the flow Reynolds number tells us when flow transitions from laminar to turbulence. And we need non-dimensional numbers for similitude, a way to scale problems that we will explore in detail in the next video. And that's it. Let's review. We started by introducing the Buckingham Pi theorem, which is an application of dimensional homogeneity analysis to find non-dimensional numbers. The general procedure for the theorem is as follows. Gather up all the parameters important to your problem, call this n. By inspecting visually for obvious non-dimensional numbers, you can save yourself some time. Determine the number of base dimensions in the problem, this is almost always m equals 3 because of mass, length, and time. At this point, we can already tell how many non-dimensional numbers we can expect to see. We select our repeating variables, m of them, that need to include all base dimensions. 
The leftover variables define our different pi terms. Each one gets a pi term. Last, we use the strategy we learned with dimensional homogeneity to solve for each specific pi term available. We work through two examples, one with hydrodynamics and one with aerodynamics, to test this procedure. In practice, finding non-dimensional numbers of new problems is critical for similitude, which we will learn more about in future lectures. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.